Anybody ready for the word? And Tyler, you guys can stay up if you want, because I've learned if I have musicians up, I feel that much closer to the altar call. And I won't keep you guys here all morning. <clears throat> Thank you so much for allowing us to come and to just pour into you guys. We, we count it a high honor and a privilege anytime we can share the gospel, especially, well, it's, all of us should say that, especially where we come from, right? What God has pulled us out of. But I've prayed for you, and I asked God, well, you know, more than me beginning to pray that way, I asked Pastor Rob, what is on your heart? What are you getting at? Because it's important when you go and you're entrusted with another shepherd's flock that you say, hey, what are you saying or what are you trying to get across? Let me just come and serve that. And, and he, was, he was talking to me about the harvest, about, about evangelism, and he was talking to me about just different things, and he released me to talk about evangelism, you know, in that, in that vein. And I, I would be lying if I, didn't, if, I, if I didn't say I was jumping out of my skin excited because that is where I live, and that's what I love. And I got excited, but then the Lord spoke to me because you could preach a thousand messages about evangelism. You can go in different directions. But I began to pray, and I asked for Pastor Rob's heart. And I've learned that that's a dangerous prayer. But God began to speak to me in accordance to what I believe is Pastor Rob's heart. And I've had the opportunity to sit with him before he left and, and he confirmed it. And so I thank God that the Lord has spoken and your pastor has blessed me. He prayed for me and blessed me to release this word. And so I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And the title of this message this morning is, Where Are the Laborers? It says, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Somebody say amen. Amen. You know, there's a couple of things that I want to disclose to you. Number one, any time you see Jesus pray in the Bible, pay attention. His disciples asked him after everything they saw, Lord, teach us to pray. And they have mimicked his prayers, and we do the same. We call it the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer. Because they understood something about Christ, the way that he lived his life. Every time they saw anything happen, they knew where he was before. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives. He was praying. He spent all night in prayer. So they understood one thing about his life, that it was his prayer life that was the secret to his power. And, you know, so I've learned that when I read the Bible and I see Jesus pray and he preserved it in the word for us to see and to read, that he's trying to say something. But we get so caught up, especially today, trying to find new revelations in the Word, and we want to teach these different things, when if we would just pay attention to what Jesus' heart burned for, we could do the things that Jesus did. Now, Jesus was coming off of a long day of ministry. It says that he was teaching in the synagogues. That's kind of like what we're doing this morning. We're in the house of God. We're in the church. We're teaching the Word. You know this is an equipping center, right? Any military people here? I never went into the military, but you go into basic training for what? For preparation for battle. In the house of God, we come here for equipping, for the preparation, for the battle. How many of you can attest that there is a battle going on? But you see, some of you are caught up in it, and you don't want to be in it, so you complain about it rather than fight. But I'm telling you, you're in a battle whether you like it or not, so you might as well start fighting. Jesus came from a long day of ministry, of battle, if you want to call it that way. He was teaching in the synagogues. It says that he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom where? In the streets. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he was going from city to city. And then he went about healing every sickness and every disease. And that reminds me, I heard that you were playing at Ramah on Wednesday nights every now and then. And I walked into the coffee shop with Pastor Jeff, and I was looking in there, and I was like, this is so amazing, the vision behind it and the opportunities. And you know, Tyler, it's like the Lord said he wants to do more in that place. That sometimes God calls us to a thing, and 
it's our main thing and we kind of find our identity in that thing. And now you're an amazing worship leader, the two of you. And I know that you're honored and valued in this place. But there's so much more. I got to word it right. That's a lot. But there's so much more. I saw you on a Wednesday night in that place just playing. Do you go with him? Do you have the ability to if you wanted to? Because after he comes back and tells you some testimonies, you can be like, I'm coming next month. But I saw you, brother, not just leading worship but ministering. And I, I saw God, if you wanted him to, opening your eyes. And I saw you prophesying over people. And I'm not joking. I saw you up there. You were playing. Y'all were worshiping. And then the Lord would begin to just show you stuff. And you just so casual, kind of like a, like a sniper, like Tyler's prophesied and didn't even realize what hit him. That's what I saw. But really, God, Tyler, he, he wants to do so much more. And you guys are getting poured into and you pour out. But it's time for another level. That we are worshiping Jesus, but people are coming in there to worship God. And quite naturally in the presence of God, lives get changed. Jesus will prophesy. He'll pray. I see the sick being healed. Because, I mean, you'll be playing, and you're going to start hearing words of knowledge about healing. Go for it. Go for it. I don't believe the owner of that place would be open up for prayer and for worship if he didn't want the manifestations of Jesus in that place. So I, I just want you to just pray about that. But I saw that, that I know it's a great opportunity. And sometimes we can get so busy, it's like, ah, oh, man, I got to get there because I do that. No, go there with expectancy. Pray in the morning. Lord, watch God show you people before you get there. Watch God speak words before you ever go. And Kayla, same goes for you. Y'all are one flesh. But it's about getting us out into the marketplace. It's about carrying this precious thing that we have right now. How many of you say, this is precious what we have this morning? And the world needs it. And so God wants to put in us that knowledge and that understanding that this is for there. Jesus, let me read it again. He went about all the cities and villages. He was teaching in their synagogues. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he was healing every sickness and every disease among the people. After a very long day of ministry, Jesus, no doubt, was tired. He, he was in a human form. Maybe he was hungry. And he turned around after all this work, and he saw more people. He didn't throw up his hands and say, when will I get a break? There was something special about Christ. That he never got tired of people. That he never took his eyes off of why he was sent. And he never got it twisted. He never got caught up in the latest trend. He never tried to just put on another car. He kept his eyes on the reason he was going to the cross. He looked at the people with compassion because this is what he saw in his heart. They were weary. How many of you were once weary? They were scattered. And they were like people, like sheep having no shepherd. Jesus being the great shepherd looked at people as sheep and he never got tired of them. And so I began to pray. I asked God for Pastor Rob's heart. And I saw Pastor Rob kneeling. And he had his, his hands clenched like in prayer. And this is what I heard him say. He said, oh, God, give them a burden to go. Whether God actually showed me Pastor Rob physically praying in the past, he let me see it, or whether he was just showing me how God sees his heart. That's your pastor's heart. Oh God, give them a burden to go. You see, beloved, listen to me, please. Our pastors and our leaders, they need help. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that he himself gave, Jesus gave the apostles and the prophets. He gave the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Your pastor is up here to equip you to work. Can I just say something bold? Because I'm not your pastor, but I love you. You're not here to suck the life out of your pastor. You're here to receive some equipping and go out and do something yourself. You didn't get saved to come and sit on a plush pew and watch men talk to you. You got saved for the same spirit 
that was on and in Christ, that's on and in Pastor Rob, on and in Pastor Jeff, on and in Pastor Bernard, that same spirit, the Holy Ghost, is inside of you. And he's just waiting for you to cooperate with him and go to work. And I have this typed out so much more calm. I mean, look, there's nothing in all caps, I promise. You see, the Bible says, and we know this, that Jesus was always about his father's business. Amen? And I'll just kind of reread the scripture. He went about all the cities and the villages. He was teaching in the synagogues. He was preaching the gospel. And he was healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And after all that ministry, Jesus turned around and he saw the multitudes. He said to himself, now it's not in scripture, but he must have said to himself, this is more work than one man can handle. Can you sense that in his prayer? Jesus turned around after a day of full ministry and he saw the multitudes and it's almost like, this is more work than one man can handle. And that's what prompted the prayer because he realized that he needed help. You know, and I believe, I can just see Pastor Rob looking over his city and over this region and I can hear him saying the same thing. Why? Because this is not a job. This is a calling. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but God gave me this during worship. I don't have this written down. That we say we're busy. And I'll get to that part, but in ministry, we're busy, we're busy, we're busy. But the Lord says, no, you need to be burdened. Because we carry a burden, but he promised it would be light because we're yoked up with the stronger one, Christ. But we're supposed to carry a burden. But when it turns into being busy, something's gotten mixed up in your heart. That when I first got saved and God called me to the ministry, all I wanted to do was to reach the lost. And then this funny thing happens, you get called to be a pastor. And you think you've got to focus on programs and bulletin boards and Nice tithing envelopes and all this stuff. It all has its place. But everything brings you further and further and further from the original call. That we were called to be burdened, not busy. And God is asking this church today, and he's asking me, and he's asking my church. He's asking, where are the laborers? You know, this is the only, I want you to hear me. This is the only true burden that God ever places on a man or a woman of God. Oh, I'm called to be a missionary. That's the means to the end. The burden is the lost. The burden is always the lost. I'm called to be a worship. Yeah. But your worship needs to draw the lost closer to Christ. If you're going to be a missionary, you're not trying to raise money for a year to go kick your feet up in another country. Can I talk about it a little bit? and invite mission teams from all over the world and you charge them a thousand extra dollars per person so you can stack up the money in your ministry account but you haven't saved a soul in a year. We're called and it comes in different forms. That's the means but the end must be souls. The only true burden that God ever places on a man or woman of God is souls. Think about it. What are all of our building projects for? to house the precious souls coming into the kingdom. What is the reason for all of our outreaches? We do these things to reach the lost. I know that's my amen section right here. Why do we have different classes and small groups and these types of things? To train the souls that come into the church, to teach them about God and the kingdom of God. Everything we do is merely a means to an end. The means may vary, but the end can never change. The end result of all of our ministerial efforts, it must be. Why am I so passionate about this? Because I'm trying to learn in my life and my own ministry to be passionate about what he is passionate about. That if I'm to emulate my Savior If I'm to be like him, if I'm really to be a Christian, Christ-like, then I must do what he did. Can I tell you this morning, unashamedly and unapologetically, the mission has never changed. Jesus said in Matthew 18.10, he said, take heed 
that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. As Pastor Jeff referred in the, in the wedding, I made a comment that the beauty of being lost is that someone is looking for you. You're not lost unless someone's looking for you. You're discarded. You're trash. You're nothing. If there's no one looking for you, you're not valuable. There's no worth to you. But we were all found, meaning we were lost, and that means someone was looking for us. And Jesus came to the earth not to build buildings and not to make another project and another conference and another outreach. Jesus came to reach the lost. We're believing for a bigger building. Why? Because what God is promising in Lafayette ain't going to hold where we are. The means, the building is to have an equipping center, but to draw the lost that we can have a place to equip them in. Luke 19, 9 and 10, it says, and Jesus said to them, today salvation has come to this house because he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. I wanted to revisit these things to bring us back to the basics this morning. Because you know, most people say, I, I know the mission of the church is evangelism. I know that we're supposed to reach out to the Lord. Well, do you? If I were to come to each and every one of you one by one and ask you the last time you led somebody to the Lord, you would be so embarrassed. Because you've been a Christian for how many years? And when's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? Oh, but I bet you I can look in your phone and see the last time you snapped a picture of your new outfit and sent it to your friend, you evangelized your outfit. Took a picture of your plate of food at the restaurant you went to, you put on Instagram, you're evangelizing your food, aren't you? You hear a song that you love and you send it to your, how, why? Why do I know this? Because I do it. Me and Pastor Jeff have a thing for shoes and might send him a picture of some shoes I found. My wife and I travel the world, and we love eating different things. We take a picture of it on our phone, put it on Facebook. We do this, but can I bring a true light on this thing? That you evangelize your food, your outfits, the latest music, more than you do Jesus. Well, what's the connection? Passion. Show me where you spend all your money. That's where your passion is. Show me what you talk about the most. That's where your passion is. Show me where you spend the most of your time and energy. That's your passion. When have we lost our passion for Jesus? But we say we have passion because we lift up our hands in church and we show up to every event. That's not passion. That's consistency. Jeremiah tried to quit preaching the word and he said, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. It lasted two minutes. Where are the laborers? Because we've been lied to in this hour that we've come into the kingdom to take it easy. That we're so comfortable in the Western church, we've got all the amenities. We got the coffee shops, we got the great lights, we got the real soft chairs and carpet, we got everything we need but Jesus. And we want to attract the lost with the things the world's attracting them with, and we're going to have to keep them with everything we attract them with. If you attract a lost person with anything but Jesus, you're going to have to keep them with everything but Jesus. For the Son of Man, Luke 9, 56 says, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. I want you to consider something here. In all these scriptures, Jesus addressed himself as the son of man each time. You know, one mission is all he had. He was consumed by one thing. And he addressed himself as the son of man. Why? See, Jesus is fully God and Jesus is fully man. He, though, his divine nature was given, uh, through his divine nature, he was given the power to live as a member of mankind, among those he was sent to save. You see, Jesus lived as a man. He ate with men. He drank with men. He lived among his most beloved creation. Jesus became so intimately acquainted with his disciples. Have you read that in your Bible? Have you brought yourself to that level to really understand what Christ did? Why did he have so much compassion? I'm trying to tell you what I've seen in this. 
Jesus, he shared their struggles. He saw death, he saw disease, he saw famine, and he saw despair. He felt the pain of their losses. He comforted them in hardships and he encouraged them in their failures. He watched them love and he watched them play. He shared laughter and joy with them. He celebrated weddings and special occasions with them. Jesus was a part of it all. He loved them, but he wasn't like any other man. You see, he lived with it in them. He lived in this with them, yet he wasn't a victim of Adam's sin. Jesus was so intimately acquainted with his disciples and he knew their pain. Can you imagine Jesus with Peter when his mother-in-law was sick? Peter was a man. And no doubt his wife, though not mentioned in the Bible, was somewhere and they called upon Jesus and Peter. And, and, and him and Peter had this conversation and Jesus went to heal his mother-in-law. You don't think that they were, they were in their 30s. Well, Jesus was, some of them were younger, some were a little older. You, you can't see these, you put 13 men together, you don't think they were cutting up? <laughs> you can laugh at me all you want, but I have some ideas and it just makes me laugh. You put 13 men together for three and a half years and there's some stories to be told. <laughs> you see, Jesus walked with them in that. He hit them in the shoulder, laughed with them, he joked with them. They told jokes, they, the, the, the women probably fussed at him for some things, you know how it is with guys. And Jesus, if you can imagine Jesus, that he's their God. He created all of them, but he's living with them. They're laying their head on his chest. They're falling asleep together on the ground, under trees, wherever. They're walking, they're sharing meals. I mean, he lived with his people. I'm trying to set a foundation here for you to see what I see. Jesus lived in it with them, yet he wasn't a victim of Adam's sin. He was the remedy for the curse. Jesus knew that his only reason for being there with them was to save them from the sting of death and horror of hopelessness. Can you imagine Jesus spending time with them and they're going through hopeless situations, they're desperate, they're tired. They're, and Jesus is just sitting there groaning in his heart that he knows he's the answer to all these things. He lived with them in it, but yet he wasn't all the way a part of it. He wasn't a victim of the sting of death. He was actually the remedy. You see, Jesus, and now I want to speak to you, Christian, Jesus had a different outlook on life. Has your vision changed since you came into the kingdom? He had a different outlook on life. But sadly, in this day we're living in, I meet many Christians who their outlook hasn't changed much from when God pulled them out of the world. But you see, Jesus had a different outlook. He was a man on a mission. One mission, one goal, one concern, one motivating factor, souls. He came to lay down his life that they would live and know him and his father. Can I tell you, beloved, that the mission, it hasn't changed? It hasn't changed for Jesus, and it hasn't changed for the followers of Jesus. Where have we got it wrong? Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. And we come into the kingdom with a fire to reach the lost because we know how fresh our salvation is and what God pulled us out of. But we come into a system, we come into religion, we come into these things that God never intended. But he works with what he has to work with. And then we get comfortable. Boy, I used to pray a lot when I was living check to check. I used to seek God a little bit more when I was still fighting with that demon. But as soon as we get set free, as soon as the finances get a little easier, we think we've earned the right to kick our feet up. And can I tell you, the devil has you exactly where he wants you. Oh, if he can't keep you from serving Jesus, he'll keep you busy. He'll keep you so comfortable that you think you don't have to do anything. Then you'll begin to believe the lie. That's Pastor Bill's job. Pastor Rob's job. That's not for me. I come here, and I'm going to put my TV tray before me, and they're going to come serve me. 
I'm going to eat, 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 and eat. And I'm so fat and spiritually overweight. And I'm not going to go pour it out anywhere. And can I say, what did Christ shed his blood for? What is the point of it all? You tell me. If he came to die to save the lost, and then he saved you, what did you get saved for? That's something to think about. Somebody say compassion is key. Because some, some of you might say, you know, it's easy for you. You seem pretty fired up. Maybe you're called to be an evangelist. It's not my call. Yeah, he has given some to be part of the five-fold ministry, but he's given all the command to reach the lost. We need to get that stinking lie out of our head that it's the evangelist's job to reach the lost. It's the believer's job to reach the lost. I believe he was standing before about 500 believers and he said, go into all the world, all the nations and preach the gospel of the kingdom to everybody willing to hear. Right? 500 believers, he told the command and it carries on to us today. So how does Jesus reach all of us? How does he reach the extrovert, the type A personality? How does he get to the introvert? How does he get to the shy? What can motivate anyone to reach outside of themselves? That was my prayer for you. What's going to motivate us, God? Because naturally we're selfish. We do our own thing. We're not too concerned with other people. It's just how we are. So I'm like... I don't really need an angel from heaven to come and tap me on the shoulder and give me the answer. All I got to do is look at how my Jesus prayed. You see, the motivating factor behind Jesus being driven to evangelism was compassion. That's it. And it must be ours. You see, Jesus, again, was intimately acquainted with the depravity and the reality of their lostness. How many of you remember when you were lost? Raise your hand. And the rest of you are lying. Oh, you remember all too well the lonely nights and the dark nights. You remember all too well what it was like to wake up with drugs in your system and alcohol. You remember the pain of cheating on your spouse. You remember how it felt when you would steal things and you didn't want to work for your money. You so dope. You remember you remember your lostness. How many of you can say, thank God I'm saved? Well, you better because this is all it's about. You were lost and now you're saved. There's not much more to this thing. You were going straight to hell and Jesus saved your life. And now it's time for you to go pull some more people out of hell. That's the call. But you see, you've got to be driven by something. You can't be driven by a works mentality. I've got to evangelize because I just have to or Jesus won't be pleased with me. Give it up. I've got to evangelize so my pastor will see how, how, how passionate I am and maybe he'll, you know, promote me in the church. That's not the right motive. I need to evangelize because it's just a Christian thing to do. Come on, let's get over all that stuff. It's a lot more simple. Jesus was driven by one thing. Can you say it with me? Compassion. You see, his heart, it must have been in a constant state of brokenness. It had to haunt him in the night hours. That he was living among the people that he knew he was sent to save, and it wasn't his time yet, and he had to watch them suffer. Can you imagine how late he stayed up? That's why he prayed all night. He was broken. And the agony coming for which he must do to save us, it was always in his heart. Can you imagine the constant state of brokenness that Jesus lived in? Beloved, I know you're going through some hard times, but can I tell you, Jesus is and always will be the man with the most broken heart ever. But that's also why he can heal your broken heart. That's also why he said he's near to the brokenhearted. While the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon him and he has anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor and to heal the brokenhearted because he knows you see, compassion literally drove Jesus to his death. It was his unfailing love for his creation and allowed him to endure the cross and despise the shame of it all. So what about us? I could have preached so many different things in terms of evangelism. I could have made you feel like you're not even saved. 
for not reaching out to the lost. I said, Lord, that's not going to motivate anybody. It'll spark up the less than 10% of people in here who are on fire and that want to go reach the lost, but it'll die out because that's not a real motive. Why did you go, Lord? Have you ever asked him? Why did you do it? Have you ever slowed down the business of your life and just said, Jesus, why? Why, why? why would you do what you did? What motivated you, Lord? He was going about all the cities, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, teaching in the synagogues, healing all kinds of sicknesses and diseases, long days work, lots of ministry, and he turned and he saw more multitudes. And he didn't say, oh man, I gotta go to the hospital again. Got another counseling session. They wanna go to Flint again and evangelize? They want to go teach where? They want to go to jail. They want to... He saw the multitudes and his heart broke again. He had compassion on them. And he had to look at himself and say, I don't have much time left. I'm going to lay down my life and go meet my father. And he looked at his disciples and he's like, who's going to step up? And that birthed the prayer. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into his harvest fields you see, once again, it shows us it's not about us at all. You know, Mount Morris and Flint, Michigan and Wayne County, is that where we are? Or that's Detroit, right? I'm trying to pay attention to signs. Those are God's harvest fields. It's not Trinity's idea. Jesus said pray for laborers and to go into the harvest. If you're doing it for any other reason but to answer Jesus' prayer, just stop and reevaluate. And if you're doing it for any other motive than compassion, you've missed it all together. I want to touch some personal things here. What, what about us? How could we possibly be driven by compassion? Can you remember the pain today? Can you? I was a drug addict for seven years in and out of prison, doing things I never thought I would do. I would wake up in a hotel in some faraway city with people I didn't know who they were, how I got there. I'm going to get a little bit graphic, but I would spend half a day picking all the crust out of my nose because I snorted so much cocaine. I had no hunger for food, but all I did was take drugs into my body. I remember the pain. I remember the brokenness that I felt. I remember the loneliness that I couldn't call my dad again because I've used up all my using up. He's bailed me out of jail too many times. My older brother, he let me live with him at one point, but they couldn't take me in anymore. You know, I remember the heartache. I remember it. Almost 14 years that I've been saved and not a day goes by that I don't remember where he pulled me from. Maybe that's a healthy thing. You got to remember the feeling of being hopeless and lost. You can't get so found that you forget what it's like to be lost. Because you know what I found that is if I remember these things, my, my heart stays soft toward those that are in those positions. Don't get fooled. I'm not the best dresser, but don't get fooled by a preacher coming up dressed kind of nice. The things that were on the inside that God had to deliver us from to even let us preach the gospel, we can't forget that. Why don't you remember the mental torture and anguish? Well, you know, it's too much to bear, preacher. I don't want to go back there. No, it's good to remember. Because we see the person walking on the side of the road, talking to themselves out loud, and we pass them by. And my heart breaks when I see them. Because they're so bound and lost. What if we pulled over and jumped out and went and hugged them and prayed deliverance? Yeah. Can't stop. I got another soccer game. Got another church meeting to get to. We're planning this event. You've missed it, man. You're planning an event to reach the lost and you pass up the lost on the way to the event planning to reach the lost. Remember the mental torture and the anguish that you felt. The feel of the needle in your arm. 
or the coming off of the crack high and you had to get more drugs and there were none available. Remember when you had no money and you were scraping cans or whatever you had to do to go buy food or you were picking up pennies and drive through windows. Remember those times. Because today we're surrounded by a lost and a dying world that that's their current situation. And I find it funny how God doesn't save us and put us on this saved planet somewhere far away from all that. What does he do? I will not ask the Father to take you out of the world, but that he will keep you from the evil one. Jesus doesn't save us to put us in churches like this and keep us safe. Jesus saves us and allows churches like this to be built to equip his people to go in the unsafe places. Remember the lonely nights and the suicidal thoughts. Remember where you were. Because I believe with all my heart that as Jesus lived among his people, that as he looked at their heartache, he looked at the position they were in, he looked at all their troubles, that his heart was constantly breaking, but he knew he was their hope. And when he got done with all that ministry, yes, he was tired. Yes, he needed rest. Yes, he needed some alone time with the Father. But his heart still ached when he saw the people hurting. That's why he raised the dead. Because he wanted them to live. He didn't want them to become his latest Facebook post and video. It happened so mechanical. Let's go to the restaurant and let's tip the server really big. Make sure you have your, your phone ready. Let's videotape this. Meet my new friend, Bob. He walked in here and I prayed for his... Our hearts are in the wrong place. We're doing it for us. And Jesus all the while shaking his head. I thought I told you, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. For you have just received your reward, your Facebook applause and accolades. Social media is still in jewels in your crown. Yeah, but I did it for Jesus. I did it so people can see what he does. No, no, you're hoping that a door will open in ministry somewhere because some big shot preacher saw you heal the sick. And you're taking jewels out of your crown and casting them before swine on the earth. And when you get to heaven and you see Jesus, you're going to have nothing of worth to lay at his feet because you wasted it on the earth. The Bible says that all the books in the world couldn't even hold the works of Jesus. That we barely have a snapshot image of what he's done on the earth. And I'm embarrassed to say that some of our lives wouldn't even fill a one subject notebook with college rule lines. What's going to motivate us? Don't you remember the rejection? Remember it. Don't you remember when no one wanted you? Don't you remember that? Like my dad would say that I wasn't worth a dollar and a quarter. Don't you remember those days? You weren't worth shooting. People said I wasn't worth the bullet to shoot me. That's what people said about me. And I don't tear up when I say that because I'm still sad or I feel like a victim. My eyes well up with overwhelming gratitude to the king who left his throne to come to this stinking earth and pull me out of the pit. <laughs> So remember the pain. Remember the heartache. Remember the feeling of being hopeless and lost. Remember the mental torture and the anguish. Why don't you remember the lonely nights and suicidal thoughts? Remember the abuse. Remember the rejection. And now turn around and look at the multitudes. Somebody say the harvest is plentiful. Would you agree to that? The harvest is plentiful. But where are the laborers? You see, can you now understand the gravity and the depth of Jesus' prayer? 
His heart was breaking over the multitudes and he knew that he wouldn't be able to physically stay and be a part of the work. So he cried out to his God and his father to raise up more like him to go out into his father's harvest fields to reach those that he loves so much. I can hear his cry now, almost as if it's the first time I'm hearing it. In my personal life, I can hear his cry in my heart, can you? Because as far as I'm concerned, as far as there, as long as there's lost people that need to be saved, we have work to do. As long as there are lost needing to be saved, we have work to do. The amount of work that there is to do far outweighs the amount of laborers clocking in. He's calling you. I thank God for this wonderful staff of this church, but this isn't enough. I know them personally. They're laborers in the field and they're pouring out to equip believers. But this isn't enough. There's far too great a cry raising up to God from the state of Michigan, from this county, from this city and from this region. Some of you, let me speak into that. You so desperately want to be used by God. You are so desperate to be used. Can I tell you, you don't have to beg God to use you? Can I tell you, young people, that God is begging somebody to rise up? We don't have to beg God to be used. We just have to step up and say, here I am, Lord. But when you say, here I am, let it stop there. Here I am. You can add, send me as Isaiah did, but stop there. Don't say, send me here, send me there. Don't tell God where to send you. You can ask for things that are burning in your heart, but you need to say, I'm here burning with compassion, and I'm going to stay here burning in front of you until you send me somewhere. And then some of us are like, well, I've asked, and God's never sent me. Well, that's because every time he sends a lost person in front of you, you let him walk by. How dare you ask him to send you to another nation when you won't reach out to those in your own nation? How dare you ask God to send you to reach out to another state when you haven't even reached anybody in your state? I preach the gospel every chance I get. They were sorry at my family reunion when they asked me to pray this year. You can ask my wife, I preach the gospel. I preach the hell out of my family. Why? Because I know every situation that Jesus puts me in is an opportunity for a lost soul to hear the gospel. And one day, I'm going to stand before him and he say, why didn't you go, Elliot? Why didn't you open your mouth, Elliot? Why didn't you do something, Elliot? I'm going to say, I'm sorry, Lord. I took that talent and I put it in a handkerchief. I buried it in the ground. You wicked and lazy servant. Some of us don't want to hear that, but it's already been written. And we skip over the hard things in the Bible, and that's to our own demise. We have to understand that Jesus meant business, and Jesus still means business. That he has called his church to save the lost. One mission, forever. It's never going to change. You know, he's calling you, so where are the laborers? Listen to me, Jesus had one mission. Can you agree to that in Scripture? He said, Deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Where is he going? To the cross. He called us all to death. And then when we died and became alive again and we were saved, he called us to do something else, to go. We've got it so mixed up. We have too many missions. We're on our mission making money. Some of you, and I say this with a tear in my eye, you've done well making money, but it's all gonna go up in smoke and it means nothing. We have too many missions. We're on our mission building bigger houses and saving more money. We're busy getting more education and working ourselves into the ground in our careers. We have, we have to put our children in one more sporting event. We have another meeting to go to. We have to be here. We must go there. But when, beloved, will we go into his fields? I 
I don't have time to reach the lost. I'm making money. I don't have time to reach the lost. I've got another meeting I have to go to. What, what, what in the world are you accomplishing in that meeting? Please tell me. I, I've, I've got a meeting about another meeting. We've got to have a meeting to plan a meeting. We've got to put together this conference, this outreach. We've got to have these classes. Some of your kids play so many sports, you don't know whether you're coming or going. And if you're going to get yourself that busy like you're crazy, at least witness to the people in the stands. But you're cussing out the umpires. Oh, church, you have to hear me. Jesus is not concerned with your happiness. Can I say that? Jesus just wants me to be happy. No, he doesn't. Jesus just wants you to be saved. Jesus already told you that the path of life is narrow and the way is difficult and few there be that find it. Jesus already told you that the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests and that the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. Jesus has already told you that you will be persecuted and hated by all for his name's sake. What are we doing anymore? Jesus left his throne in heaven to be murdered at the hands of his own creation. And we think we gotta make another ball game. We think we've gotta plan another event, another meeting. If it's a means to the end of reaching souls and we actually reach souls, praise God for it. But do you see the plan of the enemy to keep you so busy? Heck with being busy. I stay busy preaching the gospel, that's my life. I figured if he saved me from all he saved me from, then I better do this. I better not waste it. And my wife and I have conversations. We get tired, yes. It gets hard, yes. But we look at each other again and we're like, there's nothing else for us in this world. There's nothing in this world for me. But I'm surrounded by lost and dying souls and I hear their cries and I hear my Savior's cry, crying out for me to reach them. And you pulled me out of hell, Lord, and you're gonna let me work for you? Where are the laborers? You shouldn't have to beg a believer to tell somebody about Jesus. Better yet, if I gotta beg you to evangelize, you're not a real believer. You have unbelief. Because if you really believed what you say you believe, you would tell somebody about it. Because you're telling people about your favorite restaurant, you're telling them about your new car, you're telling them about your new shoes, but you ain't telling them about Jesus. You believe in your shoes, in your food, in your job, in your career, but we don't really believe in Jesus. And we say it's all for him, but it's all for us. Jesus is still, I know you're going to say, I hope this guy never comes back. He's crazy. But you're right. I am crazy. I'm crazier than you even think I am. But when I look at the disciples' lives, I thought they were pretty crazy too. They would allow themselves to be burned alive in tar, beheaded. He, Paul willingly went back to Rome. The Holy Ghost told him he would die there. He still went. Stephen preached in front of the religious people. He saw the murder in their eyes, but he couldn't stop preaching. The disciples remained in Rome where it was too dangerous to be a Christian, but God said, Terry, they stayed in the upper room, not even knowing what was going to happen. And pretty much all of them lost their lives because of it. Abraham was given the promise that he remained in the land of promise as a sojourner, as a stranger. He lived in tents looking for a city who has a foundation, whose maker and builder was his God. All of the ones we look up to, they abandoned the world. And they knew they were only here to be a light. Listen, let me ask you this. When will we actually begin to do the only thing, the one thing that matters in all eternity? I'm not asking when you're going to sing another special or when you're going to get to lead worship again. 
I'm not asking you when you're going to get an opportunity to preach on a Wednesday night. I'm not asking you when you're going to get an opportunity to lead a prayer meeting. I'm asking you, when will we begin to do the only, let me let that word sink in, only, the only thing that matters in all of eternity is preaching the gospel that the lost may be saved. Because when we get to heaven, we are a product of our, of our salvation given to us by Christ. And when we turn around, the only thing that's going to look familiar are those that we've led to Christ. Because that was the only thing that mattered. And I think I was hard enough. Now let me encourage you. What I saw in prayer this morning, I had this message prepared. I had to go back in and add this. I see God is stirring. God is calling people back to their ministries this morning. He's calling you back. You know, I know I got fired up and I said a lot of, I said a lot of things that are true but hard to swallow. If we would examine our hearts and our lives, they're true. Not easy to swallow, but in yet, yet in saying these things, God said he's calling people back to their ministries in this place today. And he's calling people back to love souls and to reach out to the lost. I heard the Lord say that people are putting their hands to the plow again. You remember what Jesus said? He said, if you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. You've been called to work. Don't go to heaven with gentle, soft hands. Go to heaven with calluses all over your hands. Go with blisters. Go with them bleeding. I don't care. Put your hand to the plow. And don't you let it go. When somebody insults you, don't let it go. When somebody manipulates you, don't let it go. Pastor Bernard, when people talk about us and they backbite us and they slam, don't let it go. When they say you're not even making a difference, I don't see anything happening, there's no impact, don't let it go because your Savior told you. Once you put your hand to the plow, don't look back because if you do, you're not fit for the kingdom. God is calling people this morning to put their hands back to the plow. I heard the Lord say that people are going back into the fields and picking up their tools again. And somewhere along the way, you had the sickle in your hand, and you were in the fields, and you were harvesting. You were reaching the lost. You were witnessing. And somewhere you got busy work. You got more of a load at work. Maybe you had more children, and life got busy. These things happened, and you dropped your tools in the field. And God says, if you ask me this morning, I'll show you right where they are, and I'll lead you back. You didn't lose. I mean, somebody needs to hear this. You did not lose what he entrusted you with. You just misplaced it. You lost it. It's valuable. Go find it. Go back to the place where you used to be burdened, where you were working in the fields, not out of works, not out of obligation, not out of duty, but you did it because you were not busy, but you were burdened. You know what happens when you lose the burden? You get busy and you drop the tools. Go back and get them. And finally, the Lord said, God is awakening dreams and promises in some of you this morning. There were dreams of churches. There were dreams of businesses that would finance the kingdom. There were dreams that would be a means to the end of reaching the lost. And some of it over, over the span of life, just being busy, just living, just heartache, just unexpected circumstances, different things that happen, that you've laid your dreams down. And the Lord says he's here this morning to awaken those things in your life. He's going to resurrect those dreams. Do you believe that? Do you want that this morning? Or would you say, God, that's me today. Why don't you stand up? Come on, quickly, quickly, quickly. Stand up. The question the Lord asked me, he said, where are the laborers? He's missing some of you. He's missing some of you. He knows when you're not at your post. He knows when you're not at your spot in the field. God knows you're missing. He's calling you back. Some of you have left. You've left your tools in the field. Go back and get them. Go back and get them. 
Go back and get them. The tools you left in the field, go get them right now. Don't leave them in the field. Some of your dreams, as I said that, something stirred in your heart. God's awakening you. And it's what I want to do. Eyes wide open, staring me in the face. If you would say, God, you've asked, where are the laborers? And I'm telling you, I'm right here. Would you lift up your hand really high? God, you say, where are the laborers? Well, I'm right here. Look, Pastor Jeff, look how beautiful this is. Look at all these hands. You see, this message isn't a message of condemnation. This is a message of awakening. This is a message of bringing us back to where we should be. This is only God's grace saying, I still have work for you to do, and I haven't given up on you. That I chose you a long time ago, and I haven't changed my mind. That's what God is saying to you right now. And look at you. Oh, my hands are raised too. That where are the labors? Lord, I'm right here. I'm right here. God, I'm right here. Come on, ministers, can we repent first? Lord, I've complained about my work. I've complained because it gets hard, Lord. My heart's been broken more times than it was ever broken in the world. I've been used more than I've ever been used by the devil in the world. And we've wanted to give up, haven't we? We've complained about what he's called us to do, where he's called us to do it, and how he's called us to do it. And some of you don't even know that this prayer of repentance is the point of your breakthrough. God, grant us compassion again in this place. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. This is not a hard work, Lord. We work hard, but it's not a hard work. All of us who are heavy, laden with burdens and we're working, we come to you and we lay our burdens at your feet that you would give us rest. We yoke together with you, Christ, because you are meek and lowly of heart. We're gonna learn from you and take your yoke upon us because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Forgive us, God, for loving earthly things and becoming too passionate about the things in the world. Forgive us, God, for being busy and passing up people we could minister to. Lord, this morning, make us so sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Let us hear your voice again like never before, Lord. You know, some of you are used to hear his voice so clear. And it seems like it's faded. It's because when he continues to ask or beckon or gently lead and we reject and we go the opposite way or we keep our mouth shut, he speaks to those that listen. He will not cast his pearls before swine. We repent for the times we didn't listen, Lord. Let us hear you again. Let us hear you again.